so we have iterated a little bit on our title. You probably saw at least in the printed agenda that this was called kind of talking to users and making DHS2 easier to use. We've, I mean, the the mantra of the session is still the same, but it's current. It's now called designing software implementations with users in mind, exploring creative solutions and stories from the field. So my name is Caroline Lian. I'm a DHS2 functional analyst, and I'm part of the DHS2 uh, design team. I'm also here with my colleagues Artie and Kim, and you'll hear a bit from from Artie later. So uh, we will go to the does it go to the, nope. So let me just quickly go through the agenda for the session. So I'll do a little bit of an introduction and I'll also do a quick recap of both our session that we actually had at the Anno conference last year and what we've been doing uh, for the year. We're super excited that we get this opportunity to again share with you all the work that the design team and the global team has been doing in the last year. And then again, we will have three stories from the field. We'll hear from Result to Save Lives, FHI 360, and then our own DHS2 design team. And then we'll talk a little bit about what's next, both for us as a design team and for you. And then we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. So the first thing I would like us to do is actually an uh, kind of an, an activity. Uh, this is adapted from the Gates Foundation's resource, Design for Health, but we made it a little bit our own. So we would like you to think about which of these kind of design personas you relate to the most. So just have a have a think about this, and I'll just go through them quickly. So you have the newbie who would who would maybe say, can someone just give me a simple definition of what design actually is? Then you have the curious persona who says, I'm not exactly sure how I'll integrate this into my work. Then you have the agnostic who might say, so I understand the theory behind design, but does that really have an impact? Does it really work? And then you have the believer who's, you know, kind of says, I believe in good what good design does. I'm not necessarily an expert, but I am an advocate. So have you kind of decided? <laughs> Yeah, uh, but either way, we actually, it's its just a good thing to have in the back of your mind, but we want to actually address all these personas in our session in different ways. So for the newbies, we want to show you kind of what design is using some very concrete examples. For the curious, we want to show you some ways that you can integrate this kind of user uh, feedback and design into your work. And for the agnostic, we actually want to show you with evidence how design can improve uh, user performance. And then for the believers, we just hope that this session will, you know, inspire you and, and continue the great work that you're already doing. So we, we again, we want to say that for us here at UIO, user-centered design isn't just a buzzword. You all know that user-centered design is kind of the backbone of DHS2 and what we have been doing for years. We want to make sure that we listen to user needs, uh, behaviors and preferences through regular research, iteration and testing that ultimately leads to a DHS2 platform that meets their user needs. And what we use um, kind of to underline our software development cycle, our design life cycle is this kind of design thinking process as well as principles of user-centered design. So first, you know, we like to study the users. We like to study the tasks they perform. We often like to um, establish and document user journeys. And then we want to, you know, analyze um, what they're already doing, the performance and how they work with then prototype versions of uh, of the products. And here we want to apply iterative design. We want to iterate, we want to have rounds of designing and testing. Uh, we went a little bit more into this cycle um, in the session last year, which is available on YouTube if you want to have a look later. So again, this is kind of the essence. This is the question we really want to answer in this session. So again, user-centered design, a philosophy that really puts the user's needs, behaviors, uh, and expectations at the forefront. 
you know, how can we, the, the theory of that is nice, but how can we do that in practice? So that's what we really want this session to answer. How can we realistically practice user-centered design in the world of DHS2 software and implementations? So just a super quick recap, again, from last, uh, last year's session, we talked about why it was important to listen to users. So one of the main things, you know, we want to avoid the disconnect between what the organization think is needed and what the user needs. If we build something that doesn't meet user need, that can cause frustrations, it can cause uh, slow, uh, slow uptake, and just in general data inaccuracies and things like that. We, of course, want to create a software that's effective, efficient, and e easily uh, understandable. So users can actually use it as expected and as quickly and easy as they as they want. This is maybe the, the point that we really like to iterate, that we think intuitive and user-friendly design can reduce training effort. Because all of you know that training is the most time-consuming and resource-consuming thing about DHS2 almost. So we hope that from, from our side, if we can reduce that time, you know, that can have very positive ripple effects. And again, this graphic also shows kind of the same, the domino effect of, you know, poor assumptions of the users and poor questions, et cetera, can ultimately lead to poor data, which I know none of you want. So here's a little recap of what we've done in the last year. So we've kind of done about, uh, we've spoken to about 85 test participants through our remote and in-person usability tests. You see a few examples here. We've been with the Android app in, in um, Zambia with the ERDSR implementation. We've done testing with the Capture app in Maldives, maintenance app with Academy participants in, in uh, Ethiopia, and it's been DHS2 users and non, as well as our global team of implementers and his groups. And then we also do a lot of other activities um, again, usability tests have been a big focus. We also do a lot of in-depth interviews. Uh, many of you have maybe seen surveys on the community of practice. We had kind of a design sprint workshop in April with Result to Save Lives, which is, was a big activity. But maybe the main or the biggest thing we do is just informal feedback on the COP, on JIRA, on, on Slack for our uh, internal team, you know, comments here and there. That's also what we try and just bring back in our day-to-day -day work. So then I want to hand it over to Tony Joy from, uh, from Result to Save Lives, global nonprofit that works to save lives for preventable causes such as hypertension and diabetes. And yeah, go ahead, Tony. <laughs> Is it on plug? Okay, all good. Thank you, Caroline. Okay, thanks. Hey, uh, it's uh, really nice to stand here and I think let's uh, keep it outside. Okay, it can only go uphill from here, so. <laughs> right, so uh, I'm Tony Joy, a senior product designer with Resolve to Save Lives. Uh, like Carolyn mentioned, Resolve works on hypertension, but it also works on uh, massive public health challenges uh, under the former US Center for Disease Control Director, uh, Dr. Tom Frieden. Uh, I have Barnabas also with me as a co-presenter, I think he's somewhere around. His visa got delayed, so he could not make it. Oh, <laughs> okay. Did, did you run over here? <laughs> okay, amazing. So uh, both of us are here. Great. Uh, so if you watch Star Wars, you'll recognize the quote from Master Yoda. And uh, this is going to echo throughout my talk. It's that control, control, you must learn control. Because uh, hypertension control, like blood pressure control, is the number one indicator uh, for how well a hypertension program uh, is doing. So uh, this is a common stat, but hypertension kills more people than all infectious diseases combined. And uh, if we can increase blood pressure control from the current global 15% to uh, just 50%, we can save 100 million lives in the next 30 years. 
currently uh, there are 22.9 million patients enrolled in resolve supported programs uh, and in uh, that population 44.7 percentage of those patients have their bp under control so uh, we been uh, we believe that getting to the next 20 million that's where dhi is to comes in and there is a lot of potential so all the learnings that we've had, we've combined them into a metadata package that you can install and use. But um, like this was back in 2021 when our journey with DHIS2 started and the configuration looked very different uh, back then. And it started uh, in 13 pilot facilities in Ogun and uh, Kano states. Uh, yeah. So. We started with the idea that we wanted to create a configuration that uh, works really well for patients, for uh, doctors, for nurses, and also for program managers. And the way we did that is uh, we started by going into a facility to see like what was actually happening at the clinic. What does a clinical flow uh, look like? So if you take an average clinic in uh, Nigeria, uh, like. A health worker comes in to see a long line of patients. They have to take uh, blood pressures for all of the patients. They have to diagnose the patient, uh, prescribe medication, and also do counseling. And on top of all of that, they also have to do data entry for all of this uh, data. So an average day at an NCD clinic is uh, pretty busy. And it's not just Nigeria. If you look at Bangladesh and in India, uh, this, uh, these lines are uh, only going to get a lot bigger. And it's not just for uh, one patient going through it once. Like in Nigeria, 28,000 uh, patients are expected to go through this process every month. So imagine like a big queue of patients that's 28,000 long having to go through this uh, month over month. When we have to now uh, collect longitudinal uh, data for these patients every month, doing it on paper becomes extremely uh, a monumental task, which is where uh, DHIS2 comes in. But we, we didn't want to take a bunch of uh, public health requirements and uh, try to create a usable DHIS2 configuration out of that. Uh, what we wanted to do is, uh, of course, report data up to health officials, but also create a system that caters to patients nurses and program managers. And from our field visits, uh, we realized that they, all of them see the world very differently. Um, a nurse, for example, like only sees the patient sitting right in front of them. They want to get their patient's blood pressure uh, below 140, 90. Uh, but a program manager, they think about it as uh, populations, which usually has millions of people. Uh, and a patient doesn't care of, about all of that. They want to go to a clinic near their home. They don't want standing long queues. They just want to get better. So now the challenge is to try to uh, create a system uh, that incorporates the needs of all of these uh, actors. And so to do that, we uh, actually started uh, below the surface. So the, the surface part, the the DHIS to data entry part, that's the tip of the iceberg. If the underlying uh, public health program is, is complex, then we'll have like a really big challenge trying to make the software uh, easy to use. So the first thing that we did is that uh, a team from Resolve, uh, his implementers like uh, Barnabas and health officials in Nigeria, we uh, got together to try to see how we can make simple treatment protocols, which means uh, a way to give care that's simpler than the current standard, uh, simple drug procurement. That means we can stock thousands of facilities with uh, enough medication to treat patients, simple clinical flows, uh, again, which means patients can visit a clinic near their house that they don't have to stand in long queues, and uh, simple key indicators, uh, which is uh, like how we can drive strong feedback loops by collecting uh, simple and bare minimum data. And uh, once we uh, figured out how we can make a, a simple program, 
then we got into the software design, the configuration part, which is where uh, observational interviews and user testing, uh, these user-centered approaches were really uh, helpful to us. So uh, observational interviews is when we would go into a clinic and just uh, sit by the side and observe uh, patient care. User testing is when we have an idea that we think will work, we'll create a prototype out of that and uh, give it to the health worker. So uh, Barnabas was actually there uh, doing the testing back in, in 2021. So uh, Barnabas, if you can come and uh, talk about the work. Okay. You can just move the slides. Okay. okay. Thanks, Tony, for taking this presentation this afternoon, everyone. Uh, Tony has already introduced me. My name is Barnabas, and uh, I'm a senior DHST implementation consultant with HIPS Nigeria. So we worked on this project with, with uh, Resolve to Save Lives, and the Federal Ministry of Health uh, were able to develop a pro prototype that we took to the field in the pilot facilities where uh, the project was implemented. So we carried out observational interviews and how did we do this? We just had to go to the facilities without trying to interfere with their normal day-to-day -day processes. So we have to sit somewhere and observe what they are doing. Uh, sometimes, you know, we need to make them understand that they are experts and we're there to learn from them because as tech, the technical guys you cannot understand. If you don't understand the process, you wouldn't be able to deliver a product that will solve the problem. So at points where we noticed they had some time, we had to just ask some questions uh, when, when they were free. And uh, we try not to ask uh, leading questions. So this was uh, a picture from one of the user tests where we had to give them the product and we, at first, we'll introduce the product to them on how to use it, like you do a demo, and then you hand it over to them. Please, can you use this to enroll your patients? And then we observed how well they were able to carry that out. Uh, in this process, we discovered a lot of things. And one of the things we discovered was that uh, QR codes were very useful tools for this process searching for client's records. Uh, we have to get QR codes to append to each client's uh, folder so that when they come, the only thing is you need to use the DHIS2 QR code scanner and you are able to pull the records. So this gave better results as, to, as compared to when they had to type in something because that would take some time. Uh, taking into consideration their level of knowledge and maybe the expertise when it comes to the use of mobile devices too, this was very efficient. So they really liked using the QR codes and they really helped with the speed as well. Uh, one other observation was that the, almost all the clients we, all the health workers we used in this uh, test had Android devices and they were very, willing to make use of their devices to do the job. The only thing was that they needed an incentive, like provision of data for them to be able to use it for capturing the, the, their data. This does not say there were no challenges. There were some challenges because some devices, uh, the specification was not good enough. So we had some challenges with them, but uh, those are things you can avoid, except if a project decides to get devices for everybody and you have one specification. So. This, we managed it by trying to provide support from time to time when they have such challenges. Uh, from our tests in the field then, we discovered that uh, data entry in 2021, that was when the project started. Uh, we noticed that the average time for Registering a new patient took about 4.15, uh, uh, for, that's four minutes and 15 seconds. Uh, that's a very large, uh, at that time is so much that you wouldn't be able to accommodate in a very uh, high traffic facility. So that would delay the process. In Ogun State, we got around 2.54. Well, we might want to ask why this difference? Because you know that, uh, <laughs> 
Kano is in the northern part of the country and Ogun is in the southern part of the country. So in Nigeria, there's something we normally see that, uh, you know, the, there's the ocean around the southern part of the country, right? So civilization came in through that side. So you understand? <laughs> so, so you would expect that if you can get an average person from that part of the country, they, they are more savvy when it comes to tech, uh, technology than when you go up there. Then uh, later on, with continuous iteration and reviews, we're able to get to a point where that time was reduced. Uh, in Kano, for follow-up visits, we got around 1.10 uh, minutes. And uh, in Ogun, we got 1.06 minutes for the follow-up. This is to, uh, the picture of 2024. After a lot of reviews have been done and modifications have been done, we've gotten to a point where the follow-up time has been reduced considerably to about 25 seconds, and the uh, enrollment time is around 45 seconds for a new patient. Uh, just to mention that we try to take note the time that the, 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 the health worker started the activity using a timer. And when they are completed, we're able, we're able to get that time, just to clarify that. Another observation or discovery was that carrying out this kind of uh, activities, uh, you wouldn't get a perfect situation, a perfect environment for it. The picture there shows that's like a reception of the health facility where we have to just gather some of the health workers there. You just have to make do with what you have. You will not get that perfect opportunity where you have a very conducive environment. You would even notice that there was no projector there. Uh, we had to use a laptop to project a mobile phone screen and gather them close by. This was even better in some places. You wouldn't even get this kind of space. But we just need to make use of the opportunity that we have because if you want to get a perfect situation, their time is there, you might need to interrupt with their work time and uh, the patients will have to suffer as well. Overdue patient management is time consuming. And uh, Tony will speak to this uh, because he is a manager of the hypertension project and he will handle this. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, right. So, uh, like Barnabas mentioned, we never had a perfect opportunity to go out and test an idea. So, this is from uh, the last visit to upgrade the Android configuration of DHIS2. And we thought, OK, this is a great opportunity to talk to health workers. And we've been uh, receiving some unorganized feedback that like everybody working in a hypertension program knows the hardest part is bringing patients back to care. And it was the same uh, in Nigeria. Like Health workers had to manually collate a list of overdue patients, like look through records and make a list. And once they make the list, after they make phone calls, they would uh, actually add notes for each patient. Like some people would say, I'm too busy to talk, call me again later. Uh, some patients would agree to come, but they would never show up to the clinic. And this, we use that opportunity to try to understand uh, what the clinical flow is like a, a little better. And then next month, we went back again with a prototype. And so uh, this is the uh, latest Android release of uh, DHIS2 uh, that uh, Aarti is going to cover. Uh, but we use the same language that healthcare workers were using and created working lists uh, for like pending to call, patients who agreed to visit, uh, and there are more uh, like 12 month loss to follow up. And then we uh, gave the prototype over to them and uh, we didn't ask them if they liked the design. We uh, gave them uh, a task and asked them to try calling their overdue patients. And it, it did work so well that the month after that, we actually implemented this in Nigeria. And uh, this is uh, data that uh, Masu, our point of contact in Nigeria, shared with us from Ogun State. 
that uh, because of this feature, overdue patients, uh, the number of patients coming back to care uh, have, uh, sorry, overdue patients have reduced from 61 to 47 percentage. And because of that, we were able to increase BP control from uh, 18 to 23 percentage. So these might seem like small numbers, like, okay, we are talking, we want to get to 50, but we are only at uh, 23. But back in 2021, when we uh, went in, we had no idea what was happening. And uh, when the data in DHIS2 started to come in, it was not a pretty picture. Like BP control was at 13 percentage. 70% uh, of people were not coming back to care. But at least now we are in a much better position to uh, start driving feedback loops and see improvements. So although 5 percentage increase in control uh, seems low, it's actually a huge uh, achievement. Uh, uh, again, so all of the learnings that we have are in a metadata package. So if you want to see how it works, like I would actually suggest you try it out yourself to see if you can actually do a follow-up visit in 25 uh, seconds, like a healthcare worker does. Uh, I am available, uh, Barnabas and Manu, our DHIS2 expert, are available to talk. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, Carolyn is going to come. All right, thank you so much to Tony and Barnabas. Sorry, Barnabas, for not introducing you beforehand. Uh, as you walked into the room, as Tony started talking, so Barnabas is is part of the His Nigeria team, and he uh, helps support uh, implementations there, including with Result to Save Lives. So um, we're now going to move on to our our next story. So our second story is from Iskandar Akhmedov. He's a senior database and IT specialist at um, FHI, Family Health International, um, 360. And they're an international nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the health and well-being of people around the world. So Iskandar, please go ahead. Thank you, Caroline. Hi, everyone. Uh, I want to talk about our experience of using DHS2 in Epic Central Asia countries. So I will share with you with our uh, key achievements, uh, our challenges, and next steps. Of course, uh, firstly, I want to introduce myself. My name is Iskandar. I am from Tajikistan, um, and I have been working as a senior database specialist in, at FHS 360 over the four years. Uh, so uh, I have experience, uh, a good experience uh, work in HIV AIDS projects, and uh, my job is to create and manage uh, data system that support our health programs. <clears throat> So a few words about uh, our project. Uh, so FHS 360 is a global uh, organization and EPIC uh, is a global project, uh, which means meeting targets and epidemic control runs uh, from 2020 uh, to 2025 and uh, funded by PEPFAR through USAID and implemented by FHS 360. So our uh, ma ma main focus, um, our project is uh, on HIV prevention, uh, testing, treatment, care, and uh, support. Now, uh, our uh, activities, so this, uh, you can see our geographical coverage by EPIC project in Central Asia. So I also support uh, three countries, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, and also uh, uh, partly Kyrgyzstan. Uh, we have uh, 14 uh, community-based organizations. So who are our users? Uh, our users, uh, field workers, who on daily basis enter uh, data uh, enter data uh, into the tracker tracker uh, through tablets. Uh, at the beginning of the project, uh, we used paper forms to collect data. Yes, it was an inconvenience. Uh, we had a lot of errors, so it uh, it, it really was inconvenience in monitoring and tracking that and analyzing uh, our data. So uh, we our backstop team uh, recommended and helped us to implement DHS two in all three countries. 
So uh, we adapted, modified uh, and all our approaches, all our paper forms. And uh, uh, finally, we launched uh, DHS2 in the Central Asia region. About uh, services, uh, we uh, provided, uh, the project uh, provided a lot of uh, services. Um, as you can see, this uh, HIV testing and counseling, and we also support people living with HIV. Uh, we uh, provide our clients from the uh, beginning, from the first test uh, until uh, viral suppression. So we collected a lot of data, and you can see on the screen uh, we uh, trained our uh, field workers to uh, use uh, DHS2, but all works has some challenges. Uh, it's not so easy because our field workers is uh, from key population group, and uh, these uh, people uh, who has a high risk with HIV. So uh, part of them. Uh, part of them uh, cannot work with a smartphone. So uh, what we did, we uh, did uh, we, we did a tra uh, training. The first part was uh, how to use smartphone, how to use tablets. And the second one was uh, how to uh, use uh, tracker. And uh, I can say that uh, after the three years, yes, three years, uh, they are, uh, all of these, uh, uh, all of these uh, field workers, as you see on the screen, uh, works on the tablets now, like as professional, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> so all the HIV sector has uh, challenges, of course. As the big issue is the uh, uh, data sensitivity. Data sensitivity. We should keep. Uh, we should uh, keep our personal information uh, of our uh, clients uh, private and secure, of course. Also, we uh, also we reaching uh, reaching of key population and uh, uh, especially uh, young key population uh, groups is uh, hard due to limited access and high uh, stigma and discrimination in our region. Yes, three years of feedback. Uh, last three years, I was in touch with uh, field workers. It's not easy. They every time uh, you you should be uh, how to say you should be friendly you should be kind yes because as I said before they are from key groups and um, uh, they complain every time that uh, we are messengers as you can see we are phones and uh, that this system is very slow uh, it's take a lot of times to enter data uh, which button do I click and um, my initiative uh, was uh, to conduct a survey, to conduct survey uh, to understand uh, how uh, DHS2 works well now. So I uh, tried to get some user feedbacks and understand how our users are happy with uh, uh, happy with the functionality, with the speed, with the performance, yes, uh, of our tracker. So we uh, collected data in three countries, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and uh, Tajikistan. It was uh, January 2024. So you can see number of respondents. It's uh, 110 people. It's, I think it's a uh, huge number. Uh, we uh, con uh, conducted this uh, survey uh, among the users who use, uh, of course, DHS2. And this, uh, <clears throat> when we started, uh, when we start, when we started to collect uh, responses from this survey, it was uh, not so easy. It was a, it was our second challenges because our field workers uh, don't trust. To us, they say, "Hey, uh, Iskandar, <clears throat> should we uh, put our name?" That so uh, our everybody knows uh, our names, and 
what I did, I uh, I talked with them. I, I, I was in touch with them uh, day by day. I sent them uh, messages to this Skype. I uh, called by phone and say, "Hey guys, you should uh, you should uh, pass this uh, uh, survey, and it it will help uh, it will help us to improve uh, DHS through the." Uh, DHS to DHS to tracker and uh, it uh, it will be anonymized and you should know it and uh, day by day I might have motivated them so and finally we did uh, we we have you can see as a huge number of num of respondents and the survey results uh, as you can see. Um, uh, most of the uh, our users are satisfied with uh, uh, functionality, with the uh, speed of uh, operation, with the uh, level of confidentiality, and with the level of security, of course. And uh, the main challenges we identified: uh, it's 50% uh, of our user found that uh, our uh, HIV uh, found that our system is inconvenient to use uh, is difficult uh, to nav uh, navigate and use uh, interfaces uh, so uh, for example when you enter the data and new patient a new client yes it it to uh, it it it's need to go to through the uh, several uh, several screens and sh you should go back to the uh, some stages so it takes uh, it takes a lot of actions uh, to do so that's why uh, 15 person was frustrated with this uh, and also not only with uh, navigation and interface, also with uh, performance, but it's due to our uh, slow internet connection in our country, yes. Uh, and uh, the challenges have uh, several uh, impacts you can see on the screen that field workers may spend extra time trying to input data correctly and the delays in data processing and reporting so uh, our uh, next steps uh, will be uh, to that we have lessons learned. So we got a lot of feedbacks and we are trying to improve uh, using support. Uh, we will conduct uh, a lot of trainings, yes, uh, some technical assistance, support user, be in touch with them. So that's all. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Iskanda. Really great to see how you took it upon yourself to to learn more from your your users. So our last story is is from our own uh, DHS2 design team. It's Arti. She is uh, our UX researcher who does a lot of our usability testing, and she will uh, talk a bit more about that and what we have achieved. Thank you. This feels like it's gonna fall off any minute, <laughs> but I hope it doesn't. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Aarti. Uh, I'm the UX researcher at uh, uh, DHIS2. I've been working here for slightly more than a year now, and it's been fascinating this last one year. Uh, just about a year ago, I was here kind of uh, talking to another set of audience. I see some people were there back then as well. And we were talking, I remember, and uh, we were talking about why it's important to listen to users, right? I mean, in theory, everyone um, understands it, maybe appreciates it, probably even does it, right? Um, we are here now, and as you have seen in all of these stories, we have been trying to reflect um, the kind of challenges that also come in the way uh, of speaking with users. 
and um, like Iskander, uh, I mean, his presentation was excellent because as an implementer, he's able to kind of um, have that last mile connectivity with actual DHI use, uh, DHIS2 users, which a lot of us don't have. And I think the power really lies with uh, somebody like him and other DHIS2 users who uh, have that sort of power, right? And in the first two stories, we also saw that configurations are powerful. The way you design them, can really change how much time it takes for users to use it. But as the core team, as the core software team here in UIO, uh, we, have, we have a different kind of a power, but I think we like to think of it more as a responsibility that user experience is our responsibility to the users and not necessarily a power that we kind of sit upon, right? So I'm gonna try and talk about that through our story today. Um, let's see. I love filling out forms. Nobody has ever said that, right? Nobody enjoys doing this. It's tedious, it's time consuming. Uh, my colleague to uh, Tony always gives me like anecdotes about like people who have been complaining and while you may think you're designing the best software, people are simply tolerating our software, right? And we have to, we have to admit that that's the reality um, and uh, we have to build around that. Um, so in my first year, and also even before that, Kim and uh, Carolina have been, you know, working tirelessly, going through uh, several kinds of anecdotes. Um, and we might hear this over Slack. We might hear this in uh, conversations on Zoom uh, about so many things about data entry in DHIS2 and how that can be consuming, time consuming, so somewhat challenging as well. Right. So here are some things that we heard, uh, something about a lot of clicks, uh, it feels complicated. It's hard to kind of really explain why it feels complicated, but it does. Uh, where's that goddamn button, right? Is something that everybody asks because things feel like they're hidden somewhere and you have to kind of look for things, right? Um, so this was very, very uh, informational for our team, right? And um, Iskander actually, while I was speaking to him, also told me that his team as well faced a similar issue where you would hear a lot of things, you would hear a lot of challenges, but they would be in the form of anecdotes, right? Somebody would say it over a phone call, but there is some value in kind of formalizing uh, these anecdotes and stories that we hear to kind of see and prioritize what are the challenges that we want to really focus on. So after hearing all of this, I think we kind of started narrowing down on what are the big problems that we are facing. And one of them really stood out to us, which was that data entry in DHIS2 is a very time consuming process, right? Um, and this kind of started this little mission uh, within our uh, design team. How can we make uh, data entry faster in DHIS2, right? Uh, we had a lot of support as well, right? We had the support of his groups because they were able to help us uh, reach out to actual DHIS2 users. It's not very easy and I'll get to that in a bit. Uh, we also had the support of Resolve to Save Lives. Uh, uh, Tony and uh, Manu here, they are a part of that. Barnabas uh, collaborates with them. And they really helped us kind of figure out uh, and see the you know, ways in which we can kind of improve the data entry process as well. So it was a great collaboration that we've been having over the last one year. And I'm going to talk, uh, talk through the whole process as well. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of a spoiler and Nancy has actually already done that yesterday. We have been able to actually reduce the time that it takes, right? Last year with version 2.8 of the DHIS to Android, uh, the time taken to enroll a new hypertensive patient was close to around six minutes, right? And we used the hypertension uh, toolkit sort of for the whole thing. Um, and this was the first attempt. So. When I say first attempt, I'm talking about users who have never seen DHIS2 in their life, right? They have been given extremely minimal training. Uh, they have just been told what the basic things are. And for them, it took them about six minutes to use it. But then obviously, when you keep using a software and again, again and again, it becomes easier over time, right? And we, we were expecting to see that uh, it, it drops with every attempt that they do. And this is encouraging for us. But the problem is we kind of stop there somewhere, right? We, we think that, okay, people will learn things themselves and let, I mean, good, good for us. But over the last year, because of the design changes that we have been making, what's happened is that our first attempt is much lesser than our last attempt, uh, the third attempt in version 2.8. And this is really, really helpful for us to know 
uh, because we see that our efforts are going in the right direction. Obviously, you also see that, you know, the time sort of starts averaging out uh, with uh, several attempts. So this difference is like close to about three minutes. And uh, even Barnabas was saying, right, you may think that these are small numbers, but when you're standing in a facility, when there's a long queue of patients, this really, really adds up. We also saw that in um, the follow-up times that it was taken. We saw that we reduced the time by two minutes. That's a big deal, right? Uh, and we are glad, and I think uh, through the rest of the presentation, you're going to see how we came to these numbers. So let's break this down into three steps, right? And I think um, I'm not actually, maybe we should have done a little bit of a poll in the beginning to understand our audience today. But I think you might be doing some of these already. Uh, so here's what we did in order to reduce the time, right? The first step was to find out what is wrong. We needed to understand the problem before we could even solve for it, right? Um, because speed equals efficiency. And when we started doing a little bit of an evaluation of the existing app, we realized that there are two things that we need to improve primarily, right? The time taken uh, to enroll a new TEI or a patient in this case, right? Um, or to add an event or to add a follow-up sort of a visit for an existing um, patient. This is kind of, uh, I mean, I'm just going to quickly skim over this because I'm assuming some of us may already know this, but yeah. So you start at this page, usually uh, you would be expected to click on the search button, which opens a search form over here, right? And uh, usually uh, you say that it's a good practice to search and then enroll. Um, the users may not necessarily think this always, right? Because for them, it's one added step. But we expect them to search first. And if there is uh, uh, you know, a match, they go and click on that. But if there's not a match, they would click on this new button over here that says create new, go on to the enrollment form, uh, click save. Sometimes you would have to generate a new event. This is what was there previously, right? I don't know if you see problems already, but I'm going to walk you through some of them that we observed. So. When we started showing this and evaluating this early on, some things were obvious, but some things were really interesting as well, right? So when you start a new enrollment, the fact that you're expected to click on search was very weird for some, right? Uh, they would go through this whole uh, scroll list, sometimes click here, you see enrollment, and then they get excited that maybe it's something there, right? But it was uh, not very obvious. And then they might click here, uh, and yet they don't know how to go ahead if they haven't been trained. Uh, remember that the whole purpose of doing this is to see if we can reduce the training efforts. The second thing, uh, which was weird for me to see, is that entering a date, which seems like a very simple uh, you know, data point to enter, takes forever, right? People just get lost inside this calendar view. They try to go back. If you have to enter a date of birth, imagine going back to 1969 like this, right? It's, it's very, very time consuming. We also saw that people, because this was time consuming, wanted to, wanted to enter dates. But then what happened here is that they would start entering the dates. 1935 or 1945 would go here instead of like 59 years, right? Obvious things, but the thing is like, it, it happens, right? Like when we are so close to the design, we start seeing over it. Um, this was very interesting for me to see, right? Because we think icons uh, uh, save time. They also uh, save like real estate on the screen. Um, but when they're placed this close to each other, what started happening is that people started clicking the reset button instead of the search button. And then they got caught in this vicious loop and they had no idea what was happening. Uh, and it was, it was really heartbreaking to see that because we thought that this might have been obvious in some spaces, right? Um, again, I want to point out here that these things of course can be taught with time and things that can be picked up with time, right? But in order to make something intuitive, we need to also see what the first couple of uh, interactions are uh, are like. These forms uh, are actually, um, I'd say, decently well designed initially itself, right? But we saw that it was taking people time because it was just 
just uh, slightly illegible, like uh, the fonts were smaller. Uh, there were certain um, usability issues, again, regarding the dates, right? So we, we, we spotted a couple of challenges and there were quite a few more. Um, but this was enough, uh, uh, you know, this was enough for us to kind of figure out like what are certain big things that we can change in order to uh, reduce the time. So we started solving, but we didn't want to, or at least initially, our idea was not to fall in love with the first solution. And that's some, that's again a trap that a lot of people fall into, right? We, uh, we have a problem and we have the first solution and then it seems like it's the best solution. But that's also, I mean, I was thinking, what's the best way to explain this? Uh, I chat GP this part. So apparently solving for a problem and sticking to the first solution is like marrying somebody who you meet at a costume party, right? Like the first person that you meet uh, may not be the best fit, but you think that that's the one. Um, we didn't want to do that. Um, so this is our entire process, right? And in order for us to be uh, testing quickly, failing quickly and learning, we want to really focus on this part uh, because now that we have identified the problems and now that we have designed several solutions, we need to test them. And if it works, great, we go ahead. But more often than not, it's not going to work in the first few attempts. And so we have to come back and redesign and kind of go over this loop. Um, we had challenges too, all right? So the testing became a little difficult because um, I stay in India, I stay in Goa, it's a beautiful place. Uh, but the thing is, I'm not very close to DHIs to users, right? Uh, there is uh, limited access, I would say. And I mean, also because we are at the global team, we are also not the uh, we are not closest to the users. We have other people who are doing this part really well. Um, and as some of, uh, if there are any uh, folks working in the in HISPs, they would know that it takes. It takes time and effort to actually reach to these users. There are permissions involved and it's not an easy process, right? Um, and we really appreciate that. And the thing is, we we know the kind of burden we might put onto a team if we expect them to help us reach out to users every time. Um, so this limited direct access to DHIS to users uh, may have been a blockage, but we wondered if it's possible for us to actually just speak to people who are similar, right? They may not be actual DHIS to users, but could we speak to people who are similar? And when I say, you know, like, who are these potential users who I'm talking about? or And what are these low stakes environments? Um, on the left here, you have an actual DHIS to user, somebody we met in Zambia. Um, she does uh, data entry in DHIS too, very familiar with HMI systems, right? Uh, and so what we started doing is looking for similar personas, but uh, closer to my place so that we can keep doing these iterations again and again. And we are not uh, blocked for uh, weeks or months. Uh, we would basically meet in like, you know, like sort of boring sort of office spaces. We don't want to obviously overwhelm these users. We would give them certain tasks. Obviously, this is uh, sandwiched between, you know, making them feel comfortable. It's a one-on-one -on -one interview. We would give them somewhat realistic tasks to perform. And I would, my, my job is actually pretty simple. I have to just sit back and observe things. Uh, it has very little interaction with, uh, I mean, I, I try and ask very little questions, but it's very, very useful and uh, valuable to see what people are doing instead of asking them what they think they would do, right? So, and with this process, what we did is that we introduced a new step in our process, right? We started solving with potential users first. If this worked, then we would actually go and check with DHIS2 users. So it kind of reduced our stakes as well. Uh, so that meant that our actual field visits were really worth the effort and we weren't taking we weren't taking like you know half-hearted sort of uh, designs into the field yeah here are some things right like so this, this is some iterations that i wanted to kind of show you this uh, used to be the search page uh, some of you might be familiar with this right and we know that some things were not very legible and this issue was there. So we tried to change this and we tried to create a big button over here that uh, could not be mistaken for anything else we thought, right? We tried to see if we could have a search page, but then what started happening is early on, we realized that this is not working out. This was also hard. Uh, we expected them to enter their name. Uh, 
click on whether it's the first or last, right? And then if we want to add in more uh, uh, data uh, fields, we would expect them to click on that. It was just not working out. And we also saw that people stopped searching. They would just click on this button and that was not what we wanted, right? So we needed to introduce, ensure that we are not confusing them. Uh, we are also getting what we require, which is that they search first. Uh, and so we introduced this uh, last page that you see, which is the closest to uh, what we have now. Um, and we also noticed that the uh, text over here, right? Uh, uh, we noticed that like, because it looks way too static, we needed to do something. And so we introduced the cursor early on so that they know that these are fields that can be entered, right? And we did a lot of these sort of insights. Uh, maybe I'll share one or two more in a bit, but all of this, is and uh, I was speaking with some uh, again some his folks who said that people actually enjoy speaking to users. It's interesting and you learn so much more from there, right? But there's no point if you can't take those insights and bring it back to the design. Uh, I think this is somewhere where a lot of people get stuck as well. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we are creating reports which are actionable. Uh, they are short and they really uh, you know grab the person's attention who whose uh, attention it needs uh, over there. So let me show you maybe an example. Uh, this is a small report, uh, not very small, but let me still show you, right? So here over here we have, this is kind of what we do uh, internally. Uh, and a lot of times people just go through this. We have a very small summary section, which tells the reader what's working well, what needs improvement, uh, why is that important for us to know this? right? And several recommendations from our team. And they look something like this, where we speak about a feature. Should we re redesign it? Should we rethink it? Should we do some minor changes? And why is that so, right? The report kind of ends there. But if somebody is really interested, we also have a detailed report uh, right at the bottom. Um, the detailed report has the few big questions we were trying to answer, the actual answer for it. So they don't have to like, uh, you know, look, look through all of this. Uh, and then also some sort of evidence to show why we say that, for example, here, is it intuitive or not? This is, a, again, another example. Uh, we see the search form. Uh, sorry, this is the uh, data entry form. And you can see the evolution of how it has uh, changed over time. Uh, when we thought things were not as legible, uh, we changed the way uh, these, uh, you know, these data entry elements look. And all of these these started uh, looking very static initially. So we had to change that. So small things like color, effort, and I understand that only the core team has this kind of privilege to work on these kind of requirements. So it's very important for us to keep getting this feedback uh, from the field as well. This was the last screen that comes um, in this particular implementation. We also see that, you know, if you have to generate a new event, uh, it comes as a different pop-up. We thought that this may not be as intuitive. And so we introduced another bottom sheet over here, uh, which allows people to schedule the next follow-up appointment. So by increasing this kind of, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, by, uh, I mean, famous for going over time. Uh, so with speed, uh, we were trying to kind of improve, uh, make improvements across programs. I know we showed you examples only from hypertension, but there was like um, a warehouse of, you know, like the various kinds of programs we were looking at, TB, malaria, all other things as well, and to, just to see if uh, we are solving for everything and not just for one particular program. And the reason we want to focus this, uh, focus on this and continue to kind of focus on this as well is because all of you in the, uh, you know, over here are working on very important things. And we want to kind of give back time to DHIS to users, right? Uh, entering data is should not be the most important thing that they're doing. Uh, they have a lot of other things to be doing. So we want them to focus on the complex problem so we can continue making uh, tech as invisible as possible for them. So in conclusion, and I'm gonna try and keep this short as well. If you were to take away only one or two things from uh, this talk, I think one from, uh, would be to iterate, right? Uh, don't settle on the first idea that you have. Uh, it's tempting, but uh, can be dangerous. 
uh, narrow down on the largest problem that can be solved. So if you're hearing a lot of things, there's value in formalizing a little bit, like Iskandar said, right? And uh, maybe creating a survey for yourself to see what are the biggest challenges that your team is facing. Uh, and finally, uh, like the resolve to save lives team uh, rightfully said, perfect circumstances don't exist. They never will. So we have to kind of work within that, right? Uh, I want to leave you with a small design challenge. So regardless of where you are placed uh, and your role, I would invite you to uh, engage with people who use your systems, right? And tell us about it. You can reach out to us uh, on COP, on Slack. Uh, uh, I'll also have some sort of plugins over here. Uh, but it'll be interesting for us to see, you know, uh, whether these kind of talks are actually useful for you. Are there other things that we can do to help you out so that uh, you're really practicing user-centered design? Uh, we also have a, a wonderful resource that was created by Resolve to Save Lives. Um, that Tony is featuring in most of it. Uh, this is on our YouTube page as well. And uh, we can share links for all of this. This is a great, uh, I think around a 45 minute session to tell you everything you need to know about user testing. And it also has templates that you can use such as like plans, questionnaires, uh, if you want to create small reports, if you want to know how to take notes, all of that kind of stuff is uh, there within this as well. So. Yeah, I think we're done and we have time for questions. So, uh, yeah, I think all of us can come here and if you have any questions for any of us. I think Tony and uh, Barnabas and Iskandar. Hello. Hello. Okay. Thank you so much uh, uh, to all the presenters. Um, I think it's it's quite insightful to to learn a lot about what you you are doing in each of your countries. Um, I think I have a question for um, story one and story three. One, it's on the um, the amount of time you spent on enrollment. I think you mentioned you spent about 45 seconds um, doing enrollment and then user three. I think they also presented a minimum of around um, the three minutes. So would you be able to share with us some key learnings on how you were able to achieve the 45 seconds just for us to be able to also learn the new techniques that you are doing? And this one, it's for story three. Um, on the search of your system. How were you managing um, the searching of clients across uh, that moves across different facilities? I don't know how you were doing it, but it's a common practice for you to come across a client that will visit facility A today, but they will also visit another facility. So how were you managing clients that were moving across facilities? Can you also share with us some insights in, on that particular area? Yeah, so those are just my questions. Thank you. Uh, so I had a slide that talked about uh, the key indicators, and I think we did start with uh, the WHO Hearts uh, package, uh, reviewing that to see what are the bare minimum key indicators that we can uh, track that will actually tell us uh, how the program is doing can drive feedback loops. So uh, then if you actually look at the configuration, it's very less data. Uh, we are not collecting uh, BMI data. We are not uh, collecting uh, a bunch of like uh, uh, other like CKD related data or dates. It's uh, blood pressure, medicine, type of blood sugar, uh, and that's uh, about it. So there are like uh, a lot of back and forth like in nigeria for example they really wanted to collect bmi data also but right from the beginning we saw that most people were not actually entering any bmi data uh, so you have to take a very strong call on what is the minimum data you can collect and and that's going to matter a lot for the time thank you 
and sorry, maybe I'm, I'm hijacking the, the questions, but uh, maybe this will be my last one. Um, so in case you come across um, a client that happens to have a higher BP reading, how many readings were you capturing? Is it only one or you were capturing a couple of readings? For example, if I have a high risk above um, 180 over 120, do you just settle on just capturing one reading and making your decisions or you had to do a couple of readings? And if you have to, how me, how are you capturing those subsequent readings? Uh, I think I'm done. Again, it's a nuanced answer because we have we usually work with the country team to figure out a clinical workflow that works for them. Uh, in some countries, if a high BP is detected, they ask the person to wait for uh, 30 minutes because when they walk into a clinic, sometimes they're flustered for some reason and we can detect a high BP. Uh, currently in Nigeria, it is only one BP being recorded into DHIS2. But uh, in the clinic, they are recording two BPs. It's just that only one is rec recorded into uh, DHS. All right, thank you. Just to uh, answer your question around, uh, uh, you know, like what, what if the uh, patient or the client is in uh, a different uh, program? So we have, a, uh, we have a functionality to search across uh, different programs as well. We have been actually testing that as well. Uh, we can speak about that and we can share, you know, what certain insights we had about how discoverable it was as well. Oh. Yeah, different. I thought you said programs, but I might be wrong. Did you mean programs or all units? Different facilities. How are you searching across facilities? I have a client, I go to facilities. I'm registered in facilities. And I do Okay, I just want to throw some light around that uh, in an implementation we did in Nigeria for COVID vaccination, uh, we had to use policies need to come into place as well. Because uh, if there's a policy that a client can move from one place to the other, then it's possible to enable that feature to, be, to allow the search. But there is also a hitch that you might come across there because devices you're using, if you're using mobile devices that work offline, then searching across uh, might not really be so flexible. You might need to have an internet connection to be able to search across other facilities. Then the, the device specification also might also have some issues because when you're trying to download at first, you know, it needs to download more data than it would have downloaded if it's going to just download what is needed in one facility only. So there's always a give and take. So the policy will determine what to, should be done. But like uh, Artie said earlier, there's a functionality for searching across facilities. All right. So I do have a question for story three. So uh, you presented the new design with the timing that led from six minutes to three minutes the first visit the second visit was two point something but interestingly the third visit went up and i was hoping i was going to explain it but i didn't get to why it went up i can tell you that so on our third attempt we were actually because we had uh, very little time we were doing other tests as well apart from time studies in the third uh, in the third task that we gave them we were also expecting them to do some back in back data entry so that meant that they would have to change the date it was it would not be automatically entered uh, they would have to go back change maybe they were maybe told that you you were absent 3 days back so you would have to change the date so they had to take some time to kind of see what that date is go back and therefore the time kind of increased yeah sure thank you thanks <laughs> sorry yeah thank you maybe just a clarification um i have one question and one maybe two questions so um maybe i didn't get it but you said um healthcare workers can have can use their personal uh, mobile phones isn't that a risk if i have patient level data on my personal phone. What are the security measures you have in place if my phone gets stolen? And so that's one. And then yeah. that's one. And then I follow up to what he asked about transient client. How do you 
on your form, maybe do you attach a patient to, uh, for example, in Nairobi, we use the Kenya Master Facility Code. A patient is attached there. So if I'm registered in Facility A and I go to Facility B, they will search using uh, which Master Facility Code, we call them MFL codes, I was attached. Do you have a similar approach? So that's my second question. Yeah. Take a stab at the uh, first question. And I am not an expert in this, and like we're open to talking to others about this. But uh, generally, one thing that we've seen consistently is uh, if a healthcare worker's Android device, if something happens to the device, like the screen gets broken, it gets fixed uh, immediately. And uh, it's not just Nigeria, like in facilities in India and Bangladesh, we have seen uh, government devices lie unused very uh, often. And if something happens to the device, the procurement uh, processes usually take a very, very long time. But that's only part of it. You asked about data security. And so uh, it's definitely not going to pass HIPAA guidelines, but uh, the data in DHI is still, is still uh, encrypted using a, a PIN code on device and the data is encrypted on transit. So if they take the device home, a family member cannot uh, access the device. And in the kind of low resource setting that we work in, the gain from using that personal device versus the uh, cons of it, that's something that I think each country has to weigh and, and take a call on. Yeah, um, I really enjoyed these presentations. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Kayla. I'm from FHI 360. I work with the standard. And um, so our project, as he mentioned, is in... 41 countries and we use DHIS to tracker in 17 of them. And um, I come from an engineering background, so I'm really interested in user experience. And um, I'm, I'm wondering, we have so many stakeholders in our systems beyond just people doing data entry, but people who want to use the data to improve things at the facility level, at the kind of country level, and even our global stakeholders, like our funders at the international level. So how do you, do you have any recommendations for user experience testing and uh, feedback with so many different stakeholders and with very few resources. I can try because we work in uh, similar settings as well, right? Like uh, there is a lot of stakeholder buy-in that we would have to do. Uh, I think what's worked best for us is to show people the value that they would get from doing those tests, right? So if it was a for-profit organization, I would talk money and numbers, right? Here, we may talk more about the impact. And therefore, the kind of numbers we presented today, which require like, uh, you know, what, what does a decrease in time essentially give back to people, right? And with that, um, if the program in their case was interested in BP control, right? So how can the user testing efforts essentially go back to the big question that they are more concerned about? I would try to like, uh, you know, see if our um, results from our usability test somewhere answer that. Um, that would be my effort. Yeah, a bit on also, you know, the both this, uh, you know, including a lot of different users and also what we said with this, design challenge like when maybe many of you are thinking like how am I going to do this kind of user insights user experience in addition to everything else I'm doing and I think um, Resolve is a really good example of kind of they did they, they had already planned activities like field visits etc and then they kind of did their user testing or their user input as part of that you know so you can kind of look at what how you're already interacting with these different people and then try to add you know so, some kind of user interview or user uh, like tests in that. I, have, and I can add an example. Yeah. So generally when we do this uh, sort of data visualization, like uh, the WHO hearts, for example, it gives recommendations for key indicators. It doesn't tell us exactly uh, everything we should track. So something that we work on is uh, how 
quickly can we drive those feedback loops? Like in, in Nigeria, you saw that BP control was a key indicator and missed visits. These are two key indicators. And within three months, uh, we were able to quickly see that uh, missed visits was uh, increasing and then using that to drive an intervention and within the next three months see uh, that it is actually having an uh, impact. And I think in every country, what's really worked is uh, this, whatever key indicators drive those quick uh, feedback loops, uh, those are the ones that uh, usually work for us. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, there was a big part of his process that we didn't respond to. First, about the risk of using health workers' devices. There is a risk, uh, but you need to first identify, look at the risk, how much is the risk, and what's the gain you're going to get from it. Uh, in the implementation for hypertension, the people using the devices were health workers, so they were already known, right? and they can be identified. But in another implementation that we did where people were just recruited for that purpose, we had a big challenge where they were not happy about their payment and they decided not to sync data of client, of patients, right? <laughs> so we normally recommend the project to get devices for the projects because for those kind of devices, you have control over them. But where the resources are not enough, like uh, in this kind of implementation, and then you have people that, uh, recorders or health workers that are already employed by the organization that can be identified, then you can take that risk. The B part was about uh, master facility. When if a, 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 a patient comes in, that's coming from another. There's a way DHS2 handles that kind of record, right? There's what is called the enrolling organization, right? It maintains where the person was first enrolled is maintained. But where the patient got a service, that particular service is mapped to that facility where the patient has received that service. Um. Thank you. My name is Saeed uh, There are some really interesting is on usability here. Uh, one of the things I want to ask is, if you tested the uh, DHS2 from the uh, perspective of a job aid or a workflow uh, or a, a distance support system, because uh, some of the <clears throat> uh, health workers, <clears throat> uh, even though they like uh, easy interfaces, navigating easily from one field to another, uh, another thing they like is if that specific tool helps them on their job or decides uh, some of uh, these uh, this workflows. Did you test it from that perspective? And uh, do you have any plans? Thank you. We haven't done that yet, no, but I'd be very interested to learn more. And Yeah. Just if I, if I got your question, so we haven't only tested with the with the hypertension uh, configuration. We've also tested with um, with the we were in Zambia and we tested with the EIDSR um, configuration there. So we we tried to because we know we can't just build you know or base our designs only on on one use case you know we know there's so many different things in the chest too so in zambia we did it with a with the eidsr program we also had a test in sri lanka in may last year where it was with the nutrition program so we tried to to vary as well because we know we have a very strong use case with the hypertension hypertension here and then we try to also look at other other things as well so yeah even 
Yeah, so we have actually spent some time on field understanding the workflows and uh, actually even documenting them uh, for ourselves. We have not done usability tests in those kind of scenarios. We'd be interested to do that, right? But uh, this is our step one here. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, here. Yes. Uh, I, don't, I have a quick question. Um, we mostly we have to kind of recommend um, from some programs when they uh, want to uh, buy devices for for some projects. And besides the the specification for the software, uh, since we are using based on story tree, like in time um, testing, which size of devices that uh, are used or that we should recommend because this has a huge impact on the using the 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 device. I was expecting for like for a quick share on during the the testing, which type of devices of which uh, size. Uh, are you recommending because it can impact on the time consuming to entering the data, not only the, the fields, but also um, this small uh, aspect since it has the, the case, the, the shape and many other things. And uh, I would like to know if you have any recommendation because it's very important. So uh, when usually when we are doing testing, uh, like I said, there are two different things, right? There's low stakes and high stakes testing. So during low stakes, we are using softwares which are um, quite heavy, and therefore we have to use um, devices which can support that. So we are usually using slightly more high-end devices that can actually take that. However, when we go on field, we try to see if we can uh, use Samsung devices. I think you can share some configure uh, like yeah. the sizes uh, specs about that as well. So uh, I think you're also asking like, should you get like a tablet or a, a big Android device? Uh, and generally, like uh, for example, in the EIDSR program in in Zambia, sab tablets were really helpful because like EIDSR forms are really big. And the extra real estate is really useful for uh, especially field visits and all. In uh, most of the hypertension programs, because these are small forms, uh, they use Android devices, except in Bangladesh, where the government preferred to procure their own devices. And it was really hard to find, uh, like in rupees, I know our budget was around 15 to 18,000 uh, per device. And it was very hard to find an Android device in that budget. And we ended up purchasing tablets uh, for a hypertension program, considering that other programs might also need to be incorporated. So something consistently that we see is if uh, health workers are using their personal devices, Android phones work really well. Like, And we see most Android devices anywhere from 5,000 rupees and upwards have a six inch screen now, uh, and that works really well. But if the government is procuring devices, it's uh, tablets in most implementations I've seen. Sorry, can you say that again? Okay, I hope I'm audible now. So uh, my question was mostly addressing uh, FHI 360 since they presented that they're using DHIS to capture to capture um, the data from the HIV and AIDS program. So looking at uh, the data requirements and uh, ch over time that the guidelines are changing, you might find the program requiring new data elements to be added to the um, program uh, that need capturing. So how do you balance the user experience in, in order to avoid uh, the data form, the data collection form to look like a more resembling a form format 
um, yes. So as I said, so as I said before, uh, we are closely work with our users. We have uh, some uh, maybe issues or something else. We fix it immediately. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's not related to uh, HIV, it's related to hypertension, but your question is very relevant. And so the decision-making actually happened. Like if you go to an NCD clinic uh, in India, these are all very high velocity clinics. And uh, an average clinic visit in India is uh, three minutes. In Bangladesh, it's uh, two minutes. And so when we think about uh, a patient visit where like medication, uh, diagnosis, all of that has to happen, Realistically, data entry cannot take more than 20 seconds. And uh, 20 seconds might seem like a small number, but it represents one by six of the full clinic visit. So one, uh, whenever we go to stakeholders and they uh, ask us, oh, we need to add DMI or we need to add an extra field, we say that, okay, they have two minutes per patient. You really want to add another five seconds to add an ex extra field because it's practically uh, impossible. So. Yes, you have to always balance the reality of the field to the data that is required. Last last question, and then we'll let you all go to lunch. <laughs> no, no, last. No, I mean, no, no. Your yours. Uh, okay, fine, fine, fine. fine. <laughs> okay, super quick. Um, just following on. Um, the person who asked about um using tablets. Um. Any, have you tried using external keyboards? Um, I mean, everybody here who takes more than a couple of sentences of notes wants a keyboard. They don't want to do it. You know, just wondering was I, if you're searching for speed. No, we have so many things to do, honestly, and so little time, but we're so interested. This particular thing that we uh, worked on was kind of hyper-focused on the Android app. We had to start somewhere, and uh, because it can be a resource-intensive activity for us as well. We thought we'll start with the Android first, uh, show our results, and then maybe also get stakeholder buy-in, have people who are you know interested in also supporting us with these things. So uh, we haven't done it yet, uh, but we are all around. Yeah, it'll be a fun thing to do. Yeah, fun challenge. Hmm. Very interesting questions, I must say. Yes, okay, I'll try to be quick. Um, so just a question for you guys. I see you have a lot of icons in the new implementation. Uh, I have to say, I went to the field, uh, February failed miserably with icons, uh, with the users, it just did not make any sense to them. <laughs> um, so I was wondering if you have any like best practices of any recommendations on like how to approach this thing, because it can save a lot of, yeah. you know, space on the page if you do it right, but. Yeah. yeah, the first attempt wasn't successful. <laughs> I think uh, a good alternative is uh, icons with labels. Uh, oh, yeah. The thing is, icons are helpful for some when, uh, you know, like translations may not work uh, and things like that. Uh, and sometimes, like, we really get caught up with the copy that or the text that we are using and whether this may make sense for one set of users, but that may not, not be interpreted exactly how we want. So there is value in having labels, but... Uh, labels by themselves, uh, I think uh, it's always suggested that you use both together. Uh, it's very, very helpful to do it. Um, yeah. 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 I'm surprised to hear, is it working? <laughs> we have a lot of icons because one of the tensions that we had between design and product was they wanted to get rid of all icons. And we had a lot of icons. So if you go to the previous version of the app, there are a lot of icons without text. And my my perspective is that now everything is flattened out as text. Like we are getting, there are icons, but kind of helping or illustrating the text 
but we don't have icons without text. So I think that's, and that's coming from this group here. Yeah. 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 It, it was a really mind changing thing. <laughs> okay. Thanks all. Uh, please enjoy lunch. <laughs> We'll, we'll be here for a little bit if someone didn't get to ask their question. We'll be here. <laughs>